I want to propose to you that what we're actually talking about is a fourth way of thinking about helping. And I think everybody in this room really is interested in how can I be helpful, right? So um, regardless of whether you're coming at it clinically or non-clinically, or you know, you're an allied service or you're a third sector organization, we all want to help people, particularly people who've been marginalized. And what I want to propose is that in the public sector and the third sector, what we possibly have is three very dominant models of helping. And what we need is a fourth expression. One model of helping is the relief model. It's, you know, as the picture suggests, it's kind of moving in to stop the bleeding. Think of Haiti 10 years ago. Absolutely proportionate at the time. There was need to organize and to do that at speed. But it's a bit like taking a, you know, an anodin or a disprin. I can take one or two and it's fine, it responds to my headache, but if I take a hundred, I will die. So helping is always about dosage. You know, the premier helping profession is the doctor, right? And they have a language for this, right? They, it's in Greek, it's code, right? <laughs> and it's, the word is iatrogenesis, right? You're doctors, what does that mean? That's right. And usually, if you do it really well, you kill them. That's right. And uh, Lily, right, one of the great inventors of the pharmacological tradition, said that uh, a drug is not a drug if it doesn't have a side effect. And I think that's true, right? In, 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 in medical folklore, they reckon that it was the year 1910, before we reached a point in medical history when you had a 50-50 chance that a doctor wouldn't kill you. They'd make you better. Um, so it's a very young profession, but it's a very informed profession, and it says that iatrogenesis, which is doctor-induced illness, um, is a very real thing. It's fascinating to me when I say to social workers or to public health people, so what's the iatrogenic effect of your helping? And I may as well just set a stink bomb off in the room, quite frankly. Because it's almost like we haven't matured into being able to have that conversation. But I find that worrying. That's worth being anxious about, I think. Because if we can't talk about the fact that there can be side effects to our helping, I, I think what we'll create is an expectation among those that we serve, which simply cannot be fulfilled. And in a way, that's exactly what we have. So relief has its place, but it also is limited. So as well as stopping the bleeding, we also try and do rehabilitation. I met somebody recently, 59 years of age, who's on their 22nd detox. Somebody's gotten the dosage wrong here, right? This, this, is, this is just not, I mean, you're, you're in the trade, right? This does not make any sense. Um, excepting, it could make sense if you're a one-trick pony. If the only thing you do is rehabilitation, and if your only way of understanding helping, because your imperative is to help, is rehabilitation. And rehabilitation, I mean, just to help you understand what I mean by rehabilitation, is just use the metaphor of the shipbuilder. What the shipbuilder does is they take the ship from the stormy sea, they bring it into dry dock, and they rehabilitate the ship. And, you know, on a good day, they send it back to sea, because allegedly that's what ships are made for, right? Their whole purpose in life is to go back to sea. But these guys aren't going back. They're still in rehabilitation. They're still in dry dock. And in fact, there's a whole socialization going on in dry dock. You don't even have to go into community to find your peer group. You can have it in dry dock, right? And so in so many ways, people are becoming institutionalized to stay in dry dock, okay? And becoming defined as the broken ship that will never go back to sea but at least it's warm here. I call it air-conditioned misery. Again, it has its place, but when we overplay it or we overdose, <coughs> what ends up happening is that we do harm instead of good. Why not recovery? Hmm? Why not recovery? It's the same. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And so often you'll find in recovery movements like that, that the great aspiration is to get a job working in recovery. And that's really interesting. 
you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when you see everybody saying that, you kind of have to begin to wonder, is it because they've created what I call a hollow resonance syndrome, where they're hearing the sound of their own voices coming back? So they're not interacting with the world, they're recreating their own version of it. And it's closed. And in many respects, I think, you know, the definition of community, quite rightly, I think maybe some people are thinking, what's your man mean by community? And the answer is, it means whatever you say it means. Like, it's one of those words that has no meaning and is <coughs> profoundly meaningful. Uh, you can choose your own definition. That's the great thing about it. So um, I think a lot of what's interesting about community is, is it tends to be a bounded group of people a related group of people where there are, there, are in, there are in members and there are those that aren't in. So the Ku Klux Klan is a community. Right? And I guess what we're talking about is a community that's got permeability, that can breathe in and breathe out and can actually allow people to get out and be in other relationships elsewhere and come back in again if they want. Uh, and to an extent, that's one of the problems with convening peer groups as opposed to them coming together by their own consent. What you could end up with inadvertently, because you haven't done the power properly, you haven't transferred power, is you could end up actually servicing them as clients but calling it a peer group. And we're seeing that happen over and over again. The third model of helping is advocacy. And this is where we say to people, look, nothing for you without you. We want you to organize into a group of people who are receiving services, and we want you to give us help. We want you to advocate for good services, and we want you to advocate for legislative change. And I think that's absolutely valid up to a point. But what I find with advocacy, which really gives me pause for reflection, not concern, is so often it falls short of also saying to people, as well as advocating for your consumer rights as a patient, as a client, as a service user, whatever that term means, why don't you advocate for yourself as a citizen with a right to contribute, with a right to have a life as well as a service? And it's so interesting to me, you know, we hear people actually really become very, very vociferous uh, in, in asserting their right to be known as end users or clients or service recipients. You're kind of thinking, wh what's going on there? You know, I, I typically get a roasting uh, when I talk with patient advocate groups and I say this. Um, but somehow I think this space is a contested space. And some of what I do, some of my function is to practice contestations, to actually say, but is, you know, as well as being a patient, what else are you? And what would you like to do to advocate around that? Uh, and I wonder whether people don't actually become so identified with their label <laughs> that they really find it hard to imagine a life beyond their label. And so I think advocacy, relief, rehabilitation all have their place. But what I want to propose to you is, is what we're talking about is a, a fourth approach to helping which doesn't just work with individuals and their pathology, doesn't try to stop the bleeding or rehabilitate people or even help them advocate for services, but actually says, part of my job isn't just to help you to get dependable services, but part of my job is to actually enable you to be interdependent in community life. And actually it's a foundational part of my job. And it's only by doing that first that I can actually ensure that when you need rehabilitation, relief, or advocacy, it's proportionate, and it does no harm. And in my mind, that's not me advocating for ABCD as an approach. I think what I'm speaking to now is ethical practice. I don't know how else you could be an ethical practitioner. But the difficulty, or the dilemma, to use that term, is that our systems have perfectly organized to actually ensure that that gets marginalized, that those kinds of insights, those kinds of practices get marginalized. The good news is that we're having this conversation, and that in all kinds of ways, I know some of you and I recognize some of your work, you are already doing some of this stuff. You are creating, you're going with where the energy is and you're finding pockets to really begin to do that community building. But I think that is the new 
ground to be occupied in the public sector and the third sectors to actually begin to say how do we build community as well as ensuring clients get relief, rehabilitation and advocacy. And I think the clearer we can be on that, the better placed we'll be to go back to systems and say, you know your evaluation methodologies, your KPIs, the way you fund, the way you commission, we need to change them and this is why. But until we're clear on that, nobody is in middle management is going to change a KPI until we give them a plausible alternative. It's not that they're bad people, it's that their job is to be the gatekeepers. That's their function, that's what they're paid to do. And they will only make change happen when that change is plausible. So I think we should probably talk a little bit about that. I don't know if you've picked up in my narrative um, that uh, what we're trying to do here is touch on three core questions. And the questions are, what is it that a community can do just by getting connected and tapping into its own assets? You remember earlier on I shared with you the six community assets, the building blocks. What is it that communities can do? Some of, us, some of us here are interested in health, others are interested in local government more, more generally, uh, and yet others, other topics. So when we think about it, what is it you know, that they're doing that they're not getting outside help for? And how do we support that to continue, and maybe even expand? I think that's the first question. The difficulty is we can't ask that on behalf of communities. We can't go in and say to a community, we think you should be asking a different question. So here's the question, and we're going to now basically interview all of you until you give us the right answer, and then we'll report back to you what you said. So the only way that we can enable people to actually figure out what it is that communities do best is to first build the community. And that's what I want to speak to, because I think if we build the community to answer that first question, then it becomes a whole lot easier for them to say, and here's where we need some help. And it seems to me, and this is what I want to whistle through on, it seems to me that if we got to a point in every neighborhood where 5,000 people or 3,000 people were able to say, through a process that could take a couple of years, here are the 100 things we need to see happen in our neighborhood. And they were able to say, of that hundred things, this is what we'll do ourselves. See those? That's what we need help with. But those things, you do that. I mean, there aren't too many communities, you know, uh, lobbying the council to take over the sewer system. Right? Um, so in all kinds of ways, I think those three questions are critical. But my argument is, is we can't have that conversation with community in a transactional way. We actually have to do the community building first before we can do that.